And now you come on up. And we'll have a there you go. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Where's my volume? Right there. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone's muted except me, and I hope you can hear me. So welcome to another telemechanic course about MGs, everything you wanted to know, the, the scoop, the, the real skinny, the inside. And I've got, uh, yep. And then that's where you can mute people. Okay, no, where do, how do I mute all? Just, just mute all. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay, but I'm still on. I'm just, okay. Sorry, whole dog, new trick. So um, it's um, it's Tuesday the 21st. Our next session will be two weeks from tonight, Tuesday the the 5th of May, and uh, so we'll we'll get going. I I had a couple of questions that came up right away, you know, on email and stuff like that. I told those guys that I would talk about the, their problems. Um, but first, I've got a little PowerPoint presentation. I promise everybody it won't take too long. Last time it took 20 minutes. This, this should take me no more than five. So we're going to share screen. And now we're going to share. And now we're from the beginning. Okay, so here we have, um, can you see it? You see the MG on your screen? Can, can I get a couple of thumbs up? Okay, I, I got some nods here. Okay, so I wanna talk about the condition of the engine. I was talking to somebody just the other day and they said, oh, my engine is tired. I said, what does tired mean? Tired is not, is not a real term. You know, tired isn't, isn't uh, anything that you can, you can use, oh, my engine doesn't, doesn't have enough power, my engine doesn't run right. Well, maybe there's something wrong with the engine, but maybe there's something wrong with the tune-up. So these are the five considerations when you're talking about the, con the, the, con the condition of the engine. Does it leak water? How's the compression? What's the condition of the camshaft? What's the oil pressure? What's the oil consumption? If one of these is bad, sometimes you can just fix it in place. You can put another cam in the car in place, don't even have to take the engine out. You can put rings in the car, but that's getting kind of dicey if, if um, in place. If you've got a couple of things wrong all at the same time, maybe at that point, that would call for redoing the engine. Water leaks, where do the water leaks come from? Heater control valve, thermostat, water pump from the cylinder head gasket, or, oh my gosh, internal external cracks in the block. How horrible would that be? The condition of the engine, the compression. You So you've got compression that isn't, isn't right. Can you just hang on for a minute, please? Um, and um, that might be a valve failure. It might be a piston or ring failure might be a head gasket failure. The oil pressure on all of our cars, T-types through modern MGBs, when you're running down the road at speed, you ought to be 60 to 75 pounds. Um, the cars with the electric gauges, 68 to 71 MGBs, those read all over the place. T-types, there's a couple reasons why it may not be reading the actual oil pressure inside the engine. But if the oil pressure is low, Maybe you got thinned, oil, thinned out oil. Maybe you got a plug filter. Maybe there's something wrong with the oil pressure relief valve. Maybe there's faulty bearings or a faulty oil pump. Most of this stuff you can fix in place. What about oil consumption? Well, if it's leaking it, you know it. It's leaving a big stain inside your garage on your neighbor's driveway. So you can chase that with oil dye and see where it's coming from. But if it doesn't appear to smoke and it doesn't appear to leak, then it's burning oil, most certainly. And that can be from a plugged PCV system, faulty valve guides, or faulty oil control rings. It's always the rings. But you check everything else out first because that's easier and cheaper. 
So that's the end, end of my little bit of a lecture tonight. And I'm gonna see if I can get back to my main screen here somehow. Um, and I'm, I'm doing the, Barbara? Where? Top of the screen, stop share. I just don't see the top Bottom of the screen. Bottom of the screen, stop share. Stop share, okay. All right. All right, now I'm back. So now I've got, a, I've had a couple of people send me some notes and I'm gonna answer those right now. Jeff from Ohio, um, I saw his car a couple years ago and we we're talking about how to reduce the amount of oil getting up to the, up to the rockers on top of the engine. So there's lots of different ways to do that, but it, it's uh, the main problem is you've got a, a feed right off the oil line, off the main oil gallery that runs oil through a eighth inch, uh, 3 16 tube, which has got an eighth inch inside diameter. And that oil just pours into the valve train, just pours in. By the MGB, you're only getting one squirt once, once every revolution. So the, the goal is to reduce the amount of oil that's getting up there. So we found that you can get a Holley jet, a jet for Holley carburetor. The part number prefix is 122, and then there's a hyphen, and then it's the diameter of the jet in, in tens of thousands of inches. So what we would usually use would be a 122-50 or 55, you can get a 122-40, uh, which cuts oil delivery down to 10% of what, what it used to be. This has got a quarter by 32 thread. And so you take the top bolt out of the cylinder head, tap the inside of the bolt, screw this jet in and put the bolt back, back into the head on the top of the external oil feed and bingo, you don't have as much oil going up there and your oil pressure may be higher in the engine. Um, not fake oil pressure, real oil pressure getting to the bearings. So that'll, that'll help you out. 122-55, 122-40, somewhere in there. Al wrote to me and he said he's gonna put a new, he wants to weld a floor into the trunk of his MGB, the boot floor. Should he do it looking down on it, or should he do it from the bottom side? Carl Heidemann, my associate in Holland, Michigan, always says you can't weld if you're uncomfortable. And welding upside down is about as uncomfortable as you can get. So if you get a rotisserie and you can spin the, the whole body over and weld it from the back side, great. But if you're doing it, if you're doing it just from the top side, you can't get underneath. Uh, I wouldn't weld upside down, I'd do it from the top. He also asked, what is that little T-shaped thing that comes up on the platform just ahead of the spare tire carrier over on the right-hand side on an MGB that has a clear plastic tube that runs down to the fuel pump? What is that? That's a vent, so you're getting dry air into the fuel pump. The fuel pump's got a, a one-way valve at the front of the pump and an outlet at the base of the solenoid, because as you're moving gasoline on one side, you gotta move it, you gotta displace air on the other. And you wanna have it dry air. So one tube goes into the frame of the car, back by the rear shock. The other tube goes up to that T-fitting into the trunk. And only once in the whole time that I was involved on the floor at the shop, did we see a car who, who, uh, who, that had a fuel pump, the diaphragm had perforated and it pumped the, the trunk full of gasoline. That's only one time in 45 years. So that isn't too bad. Now I talked to Guy today and he'd just redone an engine and one of the oil plugs had started to leak again. Oh my gosh. So just this is a caveat for anybody rebuilding an MGA or MGB engine. There are as many on a B engine, I think there's as many as 13 brass plugs in the engine. And if you're gonna rebuild the engine correctly, you gotta take all of those brass plugs out, tap them either quarter or eighth inch NPT and fit socket, um, uh, socket driven 
Allen pipe plugs into those holes. Um, you do that before you do all, all the machine work so that when, when the machine work is done, all the swarf and all the bits and chunks and scraps and bits is, uh, are out of the oil galleries. Um, anyway, th this one, the, the one that the engine that I'm talking about had um, threaded holes, but they weren't pipe plug. They weren't a taper fit. They weren't a taper fit. One of them started to leak a little bit. It's real frustrating after the engine is done. So anyway, I want to take some questions here and I've just got to find out where my uh, chat is here. And here we got uh, Tom Starkweather. So Tom, you can, you can unmute yourself and um, talk to us a little bit. Tom Starkweather. Hi, John. Yeah, hi. Hey. Uh, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. I found uh, we got a station near us all oh, that sells the recreational gas and it's yeah. you know, like real gas. So actually I broke the law, drove over the other day and put some gas in my car. So I pull up, of course the pump's not on, they have to activate it. So I go out and I look at it and it's five bucks a gallon. Uh, well, I hope my <laughs> little car likes that stuff. <laughs> anyway, what I'm wondering, you know, the world, Today the the gas is junk. How bad? How much? How bad does my car not like that? I mean, should every tank full I be finding some chemical to pour in the gas? This There's cheap? already too many chemicals in there. Um, yeah. If you go on YouTube, you can watch the guy take the alcohol out of the gasoline. Looks kind of dicey, kind of you know. It looks like an industrial industrial process, not something you'd want to do in your garage with a 55 gallon drum. Right. Um, but I don't know of anything. I know um, Mike, uh, who worked for me and now works for Forrest at Rusty Moose. Um, oh gosh, what was the stuff he liked? Um, I'm just blank on that right now, but he, he swore, swore by it and put it in, in all the, 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 the snow blowers and the leaf blowers and the outboard motors and all, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But the alcohol's in there, it just, it just is. And, and it seems to me that if if someone were to spend some time and, and work on a dynamometer, um, you could find out better needles to use for a car because it's it, it's just it's a, such a hassle. What are you going to buy? Five dollar gasoline? What happens when, when you want to drive three hundred miles away? You can't get the five hundred dollar gas. Yeah, five hundred dollar gas. I just bought gas for buck forty, and um, um, it's just better to make it run on the fuel that that's out there. I I think that's probably the the best solution, but I don't know of, of the needle. What what year is your car? Seventy three. Uh, oh, I don't know. You're running probably you're running ABD needles in it now in tw in the in your twin um, HIF carbs. I don't know what's uh, in it. Yeah, I do have the the SU carbs. Yeah, but you know it probably you know it probably is going to work out okay. The the problem is the alcohol chews up the neoprene, and there's neoprene. There's two. Two places in the HIF that they will cause wreak havoc. One is the float bowl; those those can leak, and the other one is the is the O-ring on the rotary choke. That takes a number fourteen O-ring, zero one four, um, and if you get those in Viton, they're not they, they don't fail uh, with the alcohol. Of course, who knows what they're going to put in the gasoline next, you know? But for right now. Um, the, that number of 14 O-ring is pretty handy. I know Curto supplies those Viton rings with his kits. I don't know about the other ones though. My car runs good, so I'm a little, hey. I don't want to do anything, but I'm just, you know, if it's like the boats, I, I mean, every year, so I'm replacing line, you know, rubber lines and that, but, um, Gates, gr Gates green hose. That's the best stuff you, you can get. The Gates. The Gates hose. Okay. So, okie doke. Appreciate All right. It. We're going to go on to Adrian. And this, and this is also about gasoline. Adrian, you can unmute yourself. Hello. And, uh, hey, hi. So you're asking about the highest octane. Well, it was really more of a comment based on the previous, uh, the previous text there. I understand that we should be running on the highest octane and every so often try to get some lead into the engine to help the valves. That's you, can't always get, 
you can't get lead. Lead is illegal and it's right. fr frightfully dangerous. So there's no lead you can buy. You can't, when the, when the can says re-lead, when it says anything, it's not tetraethyl lead. It can't be, it's okay. illegal. Okay. So, um, so when you rebuild the engine, you put in hardened valve seats, that takes care of that, that works okay. all right. And, um, uh, and the gasoline has to be matched uh, the octane of the gasoline has to be matched with the engine compression. Generally speaking, the higher the compression, the higher the octane requirement. Right. Uh, but I run my MGA, which is uh, pushing 11 to 1 on, on uh, um, 89 octane. So I don't okay. know. You know, it, it, you've got to experiment around with it. You can buy octane booster. You can't buy tetraethyl lead, but you can buy this volatile stuff that you can pour in the gas tank, but it only lasts for as long as you're driving. As soon as you walk in the house and wait till the next day, it all boils away. So okay. uh, you have to use it each each time you go out and drive it. But our cars aren't, I, maybe if, it, if you had a supercharger and you had high compression and yada, 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 but I, you know, you, you got to make the, you know, the cars, the cars run, you got to make them run with the gas that's out there. You got to be able to go from one station to the next gas station. Just put gas in it and make it work. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No. All right. We have another uh, question here. We got zoom chat. Um, I'm trying to, Oh, here we go. Um, uh, recommendation. Just a second. Uh, this is Craig, Craig West. Do you have any recommendation for a fuel pump if, if you're changing the pump? No, keep that SU pump in there. Rebuild your SU pump. Um, is that Craig West or, oh, that's just a private note to me. Um, anyway, what recommendation for a fuel pump do you have if you're changing the pump? Well, I'd use the SU pump because it's quiet, it works, it hasn't got too much pressure, but I think Moss has got something out there now, a little box pump. Um, that that uh, doesn't make much noise and is easy to install um, and and doesn't uh, doesn't you know put up too much pressure. So I think I think Ma and I can't I can't tell you what the name of that moss pump is, but I, I know it's out there. So, so we're going to go to uh, Milton next. Uh, Milton, Milton, you can unmute yourself and. Uh, there we go, Milton. Hey, hi, John. This is what I'm talking about. Three or four times for your true crime. Do you want me to repeat my question or? No, no. I, uh, Milton wanted to know when it was when it was time to replace your U joints, and and um, I got some background noise here. I'm gonna mute everybody, and then Milton, you un unmute yourself. Go ahead and un unmute yourself again. Maybe some surrounding where, where, where you are. Um, okay. But the, um, uh, the yeah, it's a it's a direct line to uh, to the Obama White House, right? From your office. Uh, sort of. U <laughs> um, joints. U joints are, are like this, and if you can grab the drive shaft and move the drive shaft up and down, then there's a problem. If you can rotate the U-joint, there's a problem. So you, you get one axis and move it up and down, you get the other axis and turn it up, up and down. Um, and uh, that's it, that's it. You know, if they're ancient, you can make a case for rebuilding them and greasing them, but um, that's about it. Thank you, John. As I remember yours, they 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 were great. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna mute you back up because you got a lot of background there. And uh, now we're going to Adrian uh, regarding the gas, the highest octane. Oh, we already did that, I believe. And um, and then Milton also wrote in about the pure gas, uh, Startron. That's it, Startron. That's what that's what my guy Mike. Mikey, Mikey, my parts man, um, loved at the at the shop. So, uh, and here's a, a note from Jeff to everyone. I have a question about oil pressure and carburetors. So Jeff, you can unmute yourself. 
and you can ask the questions. Okay. Um, hey, John, uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. I've spent hours watching all your videos over the years, I'll tell you. Oh my gosh, all right. So you, you talked about the high oil pressure at 60 to 75? Yes. How many um, washers should be in the pressure relief valve to get that? As many as you have to. What, what year and model do you have? Well, I have a, uh, I have a um, MGA, but I've, had, I've run a um, 1800 engine three main, and I've just built a uh, 1600. Okay. They're, they're light race engines. Okay. On the, um, on the new engine, I'm only getting about uh, close to 60, and I was going to put an extra washer in the pressure relief valve, and Dave Headley told me not to do that. He says um, pressure causes heat, so I got a brand new engine. Let's let well, there's a yin, there's a yin and a yang. I you know over over 75 pounds, you know that uh, I I wouldn't go for for that, but I I go for I go for the 75. Um, okay. And you can put a, you know, when you take that oil pressure relief valve out of the back of the block, right? Um, which is easy to do, getting it back in, of course, is all but impossible. Um, you put a, a, just take a quarter inch lock washer, the pair of pliers in a helical lock washer and twist it straight and use that as, as your packing shim. You don't have to buy the expensive one. Just use a quarter inch helical lock washer and put one inside the valve and one inside the cap and put it back to, together and your pressure will be up. I don't think I've seen an adjustable oil pressure uh, unit yet for an MGB engine. Simple enough to do it. You drill through that cap and put a put a threaded, uh, threaded piece th through there that you can adjust and I had one of those on an A-series engine one time and you could fiddle around with it and get the oil pressure you wanted. So and it doesn't yeah. matter what, what the idle oil pressure is, that can be 15, it just doesn't make any difference. As long as the moment you touch the throttle, touch the throttle, the oil pressure jumps jumps right back up to its blow off point. Yeah, you I generally had good pressure, but not to the level that you've mentioned. On the MGB uh, 1800 engine, I had uh, probably about uh, close to 68 pounds of pressure, but that had two washers in it, not just the one. Yeah. yeah. Um, then a quick question about carbs, uh, uh, SUH4s. Yes. My MG, but on my Volvo. They sneeze when I uh, start the car. Is that uh, too lean? Too lean, textbook too lean. Okay. case. Textbook case, yep, okay. yep. absolutely. I mean, so if you pull the choke out far enough and you get the, you get the um, the jet to drop that far, quarter five sixteenths, three eighths of an inch. You can you can start that even if it was in in Antarctica, with the battery would spin the engine over. Um, yeah, it just you just got to get it rich enough so that that's the only problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, all right. Now we're going to uh, iPad to everyone. The best vent cap for my seventy six V. It regularly vents with a fine mist. So if you're on there uh, about the 76B, we'll talk about the positive crankcase ventilation system. But if you're not on there, we will, um, um, we, I'll, I'll talk about it anyway. So, you know, air has to go into the engine and, and the air has to come out of the engine. And if the air can't get out of the engine, then, then whatever valve cover, whatever valve cap you're going to have on there, it's going to put a fine mist out because the whole inside of the engine is, you know, puffed up, and the and the and the pressure got to get out, and that exacerbates oil burning too. Let me tell you, I mean it, that just that the oil rings just can't do their job if the inside of the engine is all pressurized. So you want to make sure that the front tappet inspection pipe that comes up so half, half an inch around right right in front of the exhaust manifold is vented to something that's putting a draft on it into the air cleaner into a smith's pcv valve uh, on a 76b if you still got the air, it goes right into a into a fitting that's between the air piston and the throttle but do you have a stromberg on there 
Uh, actually, have a uh, Weber. That's what I meant. I meant, a, I meant a Weber. Okay, so the problem with the Weber is you've got this hole that's about as big around as this or this, and it just isn't, it just isn't big enough to draw the fumes out of the engine. So my suggestion is go to the hardware store, this sounds so crude, and get a fitting, cut a hole in that gauze filter, just cut a hole in it and put in some kind of pipe or barbed fitting that'll take that half inch, half inch hose, and then you're gonna get a whole lot of movement. I mean, it's gonna suck the air out of the engine. Then it will no longer spew out, out of the top. So doesn't have to do with the, with the uh, vent, it, although it should be sealed. The, the valve cover, it should be sealed. You, you got a, a factory valve cover on there or a, a aluminum one? Um, plastic one. Sorry, not a valve cover, a vent, a plastic vent. Yeah, cap, cap. That, that should be sealed on a 76 because it's a closed system. Um, but you, you've got to make sure that you get those fumes out of the engine. So. John, it was made in 76, but I, I don't know if it's really a 77, you know, sold in the States. If it says 76 on the nameplate, is What's that the VIN? Pardon? What's the VIN? I don't have, I don't have that with me. But Come on, everybody should know their VIN. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if it's GHN5UH, um, uh, H, um, or, or beyond, then it's a 77. Okay. Thank you. But in any case, everything from 73 onwards has a, has a sealed, uh, sealed valve cover because the government, all the governments, don't want that, that unburned hydrocarbons to go out, out into the atmosphere. So, so, okay. Thank you. All right, now we got a note from uh, Jeff uh, to call Tom Ball in He's not in Akron, that's where his business is, but I can't think of, um, you, anybody can write me later, Tom Ball, who's a NAMGAR member, um, rebuilds fuel pumps, does a really nice job at it, they're beautiful. Um, he's not very aggressive about selling them, he's got a little ad in the back of the NAMGAR MGA newsletter, but nowhere else, but he's got really nice pumps. Nothing wrong with a factory pump, and a factory pump with points, not electronic, all electronics fail, always. Uh, with a factory pump, you can take your fist or a stick or a stone or a hammer or <laughs> naughty words, and you can beat on that fuel pump and you can make it chatter a little bit to get home. I've, I've, I've seen people with scabs of blood on their, on their fist from beating from behind the passenger seat, but you can't do that with, a, with an electronic unit. <laughs> And uh, here I got a note uh, from uh, Noonster7, who says the square pump from Moss, which Craig West was asking about, is a facet, F-A-C-E-T, facet pump. All right, now I got iPad, everybody. Idea is to troubleshoot my 76P, which cuts out, then restarts. When it cuts out, the tack drops quickly. And that's me again, John. When, okay. I, when that happens, I just turn the key and it just starts right back up. Okay. So when the ta when you're losing your tag, and I wish I I wish I knew. Do you have do you know do you, do you have electric cooling fans or an engine cooling fan? Um, electric cooling fan. Electrical fans. All right. So that's a that's a seventy seven B or newer, um, and you have what's called an ignition relay, which is really a fan relay, mm -hmm. um, which is located to the forward side of the fuse box. That's what's failed. So it, it, it'll it make contact until maybe the fans come on or whatever decides it doesn't want to make contact. You lose contact, something happens inside that, that relay. It's uh, the old Lucas number was SRB402 the single pole, single throw, normally open relay, but Moss, Moss sells it. It's the, it's the uh, you can get it from Moss. SRB, Sierra Romeo Bravo 402. And the Moss, Moss sells it. it. It's the same as the starter relay for all MGBs 1970 <laughs> through 1980. The same thing. And just offhand, that's it. The, 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 
telltale thing here is that that tag drops to zero, which means you've lost mm -hmm. all your electrics, mm -hmm. but only for an instant, you know? Mm -hmm. So now it could be that someone's done some home wiring and you've got a, you've got a dirty fuse box and that's causing the problem. But if it's original factory wiring un unmolested, it, it shouldn't be the fuse box that's giving you this trouble. But there's always a reason to clean a fuse box. And if you do, just take all, just take a picture of it with your phone, um, make a diagram, something or other, pull all the wires off it, take it off, take the fuses out, scrub it with a brush, put it in a, in a bowl of uh, ammonia, sandblast it, use your kid's toothbrush on it, something or other, get it nice and clean, and put it back on, hook the wires back up. Except you can get it in upside down. Do that. Start the car, but you can't turn it off. So, um, so there's a bridged connection on the back side. When you take the fuse box off, you'll see it. It goes at the top. That's that's the that's the warning there. Let me make an unabashed uh, plea for for uh, uh, this is tacky for PayPal. Um, I, uh, I I appreciate it's uh, it, it's worked out very well so far, and I do appreciate. Um, the PayPal um, contributions I've got, five bucks, 10 bucks, every now and then somebody gets really wild and gives me a whole lot of money. It's like, yes, <laughs> it's, you know, that's it's, it's tremendous. And that's why I can afford to do this. And I wanna say too, for the people who are in the clubs out there, um, this is an odd time, although, you know, after the, after the virus passes, um, stuff will be left in the wake and maybe Zoom will be a new popular way of, of getting in touch. But I'm happy to do this for clubs too, where we've got a smaller group of people and and because right now we got a hundred people logged in. And I did buy the um the upgraded version of this so I can take more than a hundred people. I haven't seen more than a hundred on yet, but I, I I think I bought it. I meant to buy it. Um, anyway, so that that's uh that's the advertisement. Okay now we got Vinny Michello with a with a must be a 62 mark 2 mga and a couple thousand miles a year how often should i be adding grease to the fittings on the suspension so vinnie if you're there you can you can uh, unmute yourself and come on in i'm um, here thanks for doing this john appreciate it okay all right um anyway um i you know i grease it once a year I just, you know, just grease it once a year. It doesn't seem like it should need it, but you know, that's the only thing you can do to keep the car in good shape. I've got a friend in Chicago, Jeff Powell, who bought his 1971 Blaze MGB from Sid Beer in St. Ives when Jeff was in the Air Force in England. And he greased his front suspension every 2,500 miles, every 2,500 miles. And when he took it apart to restore it, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, he took the kingpins apart and they were all but perfect. Wow. He greased it so much. So you can't, you just can't go, it just can't go wrong greasing it, you know? So, you know, it's, it's the drive shaft, the slip joint, the, the zerk on the, on the um, handbrake cable, you know, the, the front suspension, not the rack and pinion. That doesn't take grease, that takes oil, 90 weight gear oil. And uh, remember to put a squirt of oil in the back of the dynamo. It says oil, can't read it because of its location. And also take the rotor off the, off the distributor, put a couple drops of oil down inside, inside the, the, uh, where the rotor goes, just to keep it all, all lubed up and change the oil. It doesn't make a difference how many, how many miles you get on it. And make sure that you use a high zinc oil. We used Brad Penn oil at the shop, um, but that's hard to find. You can't f buy it on the shelf very easily. Um, but Valvoline makes a great oil, Valvoline VR1, Victor Romeo. Probably stands for Valvoline Racing, I don't know. But it's got, it's got 12, 1300 parts per million of ZDDP in it, and it'll help to protect your cam. That's what I use. Thanks, John. Okie doke. Thanks. All right. We got uh, Larry Maselli in Florida again. I had a one-year-old SU fuel pump uh, die on my 52DD, um, and uh, 
Uh, yeah, it's a it's a regular. Larry, you can tune in if you want here. Um, yeah, I'm here, John. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, there's actually a little more to the story. The the car had sat while I was uh, redoing the dashboard for about a year. Uh, things take longer than you plan. And right. when I when I started it back up, there was a clog in the fuel line, so I cleared all of that. And uh, the car, the, the motor, it, it, it's a two, well, about a three-year-old restoration, frame-up restoration. <clears throat> it was running fine, and then all of a sudden, it just stopped. Okay. Um, so the fuel pump on it, I'd actually replaced one already because I used the original when I restored it. That died. It was an aftermarket. I wanted to put an SU. I put an SU on it, brand spanking new, non-electronic. Good. Uh, and when it died, I had to move the car from where it was, and I just bought another one, uh, brand spanking new. And that works. And it works, but the fuel filter, I've got a filter between the pump and the carbs, and it's only filling up just a tiny little bit. And I'm wondering, well, it's um, two problems. One, can I fix the old fuel pump? Yes. And two, do I still have a restriction in my fuel line? Um, um, number one, yes, you can fix your old fuel pump. You can look at the, my video on, on YouTube. You can do it. You can follow the instructions in the book. Um, the book says to, uh, to, un, to unscrew the diaphragm two-thirds of a turn, unscrew it a full, a full turn, okay, just when you're reading the factory instructions. Um, you can send your pump off to Tom Ball. And again, he's not in Akron. I don't know. You can send me an email. I'll, I'll get you in touch with Tom. He does a, a real nice job on them. Um, and then why does the fuel filter only seem to have a trickle of, of fuel in it? Because it's got an air bubble in it. That's why. So if you were to take the line off the carburetor and put it up in the air, that the, the bubble would come out, out of it, and then you wouldn't even see the gasoline move at all. But apparently there's enough gasoline moving in there. You've driven the car at 50 miles an hour? Uh, I won't say I've driven it at 50, but I've driven it at 35 and there's no problems at all. Okay, well then, then there's, you're getting plenty of fuel. So that just right. because the fuel filter's got air in it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with how much fuel is going through it. Seems counterintuitive, but that's the case. Sometimes the line from the tank to the pump plugs up. And when that happens, then the fuel pump gets hot. You put your hand on it, the fuel pump's hot because it's trying to suck in and the solenoid is working. It's trying to pull the diaphragm and it can't. Um, so the fuel pump gets really hot um, in that you can tell then there's an inlet restriction. But if you can drive the car at 35, if you can drive it at 55, um, then, then there isn't an inlet restriction. So, and it's the, the points are, are uh, the original points is just a one blade. Uh, and then, and then uh, later they went to two blades, uh, twice a chance of failure, right? With two. <laughs> yeah. And they're tungsten points. Uh, so I either just scratch them up on some, on some fine sandpaper, just take them out, rub them, get them nice and clean, get it adjusted. It'll work great. Great. Thank you, John. Okay. All right. Now we've got a note here from uh, Al First to everyone. My MGB GT has a sway bar installed and tube shocks. So anyway, uh, Al First to everyone. If you're on, you can come on. I'm, I'm on. Okay. All right. So anyway, is the rear bar sway bar necessary or overkill? Um, and is the sway bar a stock feature on a 69 MGB GT? No, it is not stock. Almost always they tear out. I mean, there's a lot of force there. You just can't imagine the force. Mm. And uh, usually when it's clamped to the bottom of the trunk, it's done poorly, usually, because you need some pretty good sized plates on top to, to even out the load. And because if it's just bolts going through the body, eventually the, it works and cracks and, and comes out. The sway bar back there doesn't hurt anything. It helps keep the car on, on the level. In 1977, they finally added a rear anti-sway bar. 
as as a factory piece. It's heaven. It's nice. The cars stay nice and firm and straight. Uh, I haven't seen very many rear ones installed. If it's on there, it's not causing any trouble. I'd leave it. You know. Okay. Thanks. Okay, no. All right. Now we're going to come down here from H H Mac three. Yep, the tube shocks. He's got some notes on here. Um, uh, Chevy PCV valve on my MGB with a Weber. That's interesting. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure how those work. Oh, here's a note to everybody with Tom Ball's phone number. So that's on the that's on the chat session there on the side. Three three zero triple six two six four two. Uh, and now we got a note from Adrian about carburetor rebuilders. Can I recommend one? Well, the carburetor king, just talked to him two days ago, is Joe Curto in College Point, New York. Um, he's he's uh, four or six weeks behind. Of course, in springtime, he gets far farther behind than, than the rest of the time. I know there's a guy in Oklahoma that, that does them. There's a lot of people around that do carburetors. And do a nice job at it, but there's nobody that I can recommend more than another. If, if Joe's pretty straight up, um, my my guess is if you're calling from someplace where there is a competent re rebuilder and you can't get he can't get yours done fast enough, he uh, he might pass along somebody who could do it faster for you. I I don't want to speak for him, but all right. Now we've got uh, Nick Conklin. Uh, it's a Sprite question. I have a C75B on my 948. Yeah, it's supercharged. Oh, 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 supercharged. Why do I have to set the idle high to avoid it dying when I stop? Oh, my. Well, dying when you stop usually has to do with mixture, usually. That's or, Yeah, I, I have to with the choke pulled out about halfway until I get to, you know, 185, 190, then I can push it in and it'll, it'll run, uh, it, run it runs very well. Yeah, but if, I I, if I'm running hard and I stop, it'll stumble and fall. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, I, I got a little bit of experience with blowers. Um, if it was normally just a carbureted B, um, you could, you're coming off, a, um, you, cook, you let your foot off of the throttle, all of a sudden the intake manifold vacuum goes way up. And if you've got any kind of air leak, it'll lean the mixture out, it'll kill it. Restart just like that, just like it was never a problem, and continue to run even idle, you know, but it's just coming off a, a fast speed. I know some people sometimes think it has to do with the gasoline sloshing and the float ball, but I, I'm... I really don't know. I, I don't know that, that much about blowers. Carl Heidemann does. Okay, thank you. So, what, who? Carl Heidemann at Eclectic Motor Works in Holland, Michigan. Not electric. Eclectic. Eclectic. Yeah, he's, uh, he's got a full-time job uh, with Hope College. And like every educational institution, they're all just screaming bloody murder right now they got no money and and things are all buggered up i don't know if he's free to talk or not but alan answers the phone when you call at eclectic and you can pass the information along maybe maybe carl's got some ideas all right thanks sure sure uh here we go let's see uh hey look at this there are at least 15 people on here from the mg car club of toronto great peter miller thank you very much um, from Jeff to everyone, I use an Airtex fuel pump with a two to four and a half PSI and a 30 gallon per hour flow rate that's less expensive than a facet. Um, Airtex, A-I-R-T-E-X. So that's over there on that, on that chat on the sideball there. Um, so let's go to John Tershak here. Speaking of sway bars, what's the difference between the MGB sway bar and the MGA? None, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, so, John, you can come on if you're if you're still on here. 
and um, uh, the MGB sway bar fits exactly onto an MGA. You can do some hocus pocus, you, or if you're Mr. Original, you can buy all the original stuff and, and it looks great, um, but you can put an MGB one on and it works just fine. Absolutely, um, it just, that's what I've got on mine. I put one on mine in 1980. So you got your choice of the of the nine sixteenths or the five eighths. Well, if you're gonna put one on, you want to put the bigger one on. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, this you know it's designed to take a, a nine sixteenths, and a five eighths is for a GT because the GT is supposedly a, a little heavier. Um, but that's not really true. The GT's got a um, uh, the same kind of weight in the front end. Um, as, a, as a roadster, a little heavier in the back may, maybe, but anyway, 9 sixteenths or 5.8s. Five, five Adrian, my car is coming out of hibernation, 18 years. What's your recommendation for getting it roadworthy? Can you give me what, uh, what you feel is a good basic checklist of jobs it'll need? Go on my website. On my website and on the top ribbon on the website is something that says forms, something like, I haven't looked at my own website in a couple, I can't remember. I think it says forms and in there is a complete lubrication. We try, I tried for 40 years to come up with a sexier name than the complete lubrication. I could never do it. That's what, what it is. And um, I was talking to my girlfriend today and said that my daughter just taken my, my, GM Equinox to, to the dealer and they wanted to spend 500 bucks on changing some oils and stuff. And my girlfriend said, oh my gosh, that sounds like a ripoff. And I said, well, our complete lube at the shop was almost a thousand bucks by, by the time um, I turned the business over to Forrest because it took all day. And that's what this list is. It's an all day list of draining the differential and filling up the rear shocks and taking apart the rear brakes bleeding and adjusting them and sanding them and exercising the front brake calipers and, and the greasing the drive shaft and, and repacking the front wheel bearings. And after 18 years, changing all the hoses and the fan belt, dumping the fuel out, it's a, it's a, it's a project. I mean, when you're not skilled, you know, it's a, it's a full weekend project. And remember, don't just get it running to go out and see what it feels like. Get it stopping and then go out and see what it feels like, or then get it running, but get it stopping first because the brakes are the most important part of it. So anyway, it's on my website. It's, a, it's called a complete lubrication, belts, hoses. I just do those just as a matter of course and flush out the cooling system. We never added that in on the complete lube, but I've been talking to people about doing that recently. Um, the, uh, the heater matrix just fills with this red silt rust from the engine block. So when you're changing hoses, you take your garden hose and put it into the, um, into the outlet at the top of the heater on the MGB and just turn on the garden hose or use your sprayer and run full blast. And it'll out of the, out of the inlet down by the heater control valve, it'll, it'll blow red horrid stuff out of there for half a minute until the heater matrix is clear. So anyway, that's the, the, the complete lube. Tires, don't forget about tires. And, the, and the, the last place I got reasonable tires was either from Universal Tire in Hershey, Pennsylvania, or Coker Tire Company in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They're the same company, I believe. And at the time, this is three or four or five years ago that I got mine, the hot, the hot tire at the time was the Vredestein, V-R-E-D, Dutch tire. Um, I don't know if that's still the, 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 the case or not, but at the time it was. Don't go to your normal tire shop and get some 205 60s or something or other because the tires will be that wide and your car just isn't going to handle well. So, All right, now we've got... Uh, from Jeff to everyone about a rear hub and a loose bearing. Jeff, you can come on. Um, okay, I'm back. Oh, all right, okay. This, um, this is your MGA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got wire wheels or disc wheels? Disc wheels. 
So if you grab the wheel, you can move it? No, no. Um, I've noticed, I, I think my bearings are good, but I've noticed uh, when I was pulling, um, I pulled the differential, which I took down to uh, John um, Esposito. To, sure. to take and he said it was fine, so that wasn't my problem. But while, while I was pulling the um, half shafts, uh, I noticed that my hub um, could slide inward about okay. a quarter inch, half an inch. So, so the outside race of the bearing is not perfectly snug um, to the hub. Is that going to cause me a problem? Absolutely. Um, so um, there's a couple things. First of all, there is a ring about that big around and about that, that thick. That, that fits in underneath the axle on a wire behind wheel. the hub behind the hub um, between the bearing and the and and the and the and the wire wheel spline hub. Look, look in the Moss catalog and you okay. you'll see it. Yes. Oh, I th yeah, I think I have yeah, I have that. Okay, uh, so so the just... so the bearing gets sandwiched there. So the bearing yeah. sandwiched w with that. So can the hub still move back and forth some? No, it's only when the half shaft was loose. In other words, the uh, these are these are disc brakes, uh, disc um, disc wheel drum brake. Disc wheels, drum brakes. So the drum is off. I've pulled the I, half shaft. If you're, there's always going to be some movement there, but you shouldn't be able to take the hub and slide it off the bearing. Okay. I, I was yeah, I was able to okay. do that. So the problem is that's an octagonal nut that no one has a wrench for. Well, that's not true. You can you can buy the wrench. It's frightfully expensive, and they, those nuts tighten in the direction of wheel rotation. So then you got to use a slide hammer and get the thing off, and you drive the bearing out, change the hub seal while you're doing that by hand. Never put it on the press. You change the hub seal, you wreck the wreck those hubs, and um, and take a prick punch and put a thousand little pricks on the inside of there and then use some uh, green Loctite and put the bearing back, back in, tighten it all, all up and then it won't get any looser. Put the pricks on the inside of the hub? Yep, on the, on the, in, on the, on the inside so that the bearing, the bearing is, is forced, you know, forced like, like this. <laughs> this is hard on the television or on the, on the screen here, but yeah, so, so that, so that the, the, the pricks are, the pricks are on the inside of the hub and then, and then when you slide the, the, the bearing in, it's going to hold it. So okay, I get it. Green, green Loctite. So thread, uh, not thread locker, but bearing, bearing stuff. Bearing Loctite. Okay, thank you. I think it's, I think, I think it's green. So I was going to ignore that problem, but now that you've told me, I got Well, <laughs> as long as it's all snugged up and tight, you probably don't have a problem. Yeah, so, all right. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see, Larry Maselli, please repeat my, my, my uh, PayPal address. It's, my, it's really easy. It's my email address. And my email address is John Twist, J O H N T W I S T, at University Motors LTD.com. Now, the easier way is to just go on my website and find the little yellow PayPal button that says something like, help John afford his retirement or something like that. But you can, you can go there and, and do it. But anything you do, it I greatly appreciate. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Shannon, what causes engine run on? I've got a 76 midget. So Shannon can come on. And occasionally when I turn it off, the engine will rattle on. The gulp valve is there and connected. And I'm not sure how to tell if it's working or not. So if Shannon's there, Shannon can come on, but we'll talk about it anyway. Yeah, From it's actually my, my wife's computer, so she's right. a Shannon. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, you didn't look like a Shannon, but I, you know, I mean, you know, it is 2020. Um, yeah. So um, from 1973 through 1980, there's an anti-run-on valve that's installed in the positive crankcase ventilation system that's, that's coupled with the charcoal canister. This, um, this device is designed to put a vacuum on top of the gasoline in the float bowl right when you turn the car off. When you do that, 
the vacuum at the, at the, uh, at the Venturi sucking the gasoline out of the jet cannot work anymore because now there's gasoline on, uh, there's a vacuum on top of the gasoline in the float bowl. So the car stops dead, just like that. It's, uh, it's, when, when it's working great, you can energize it. And um, when the car's running, and it just instantly stops. I mean, it just, it's, it's out of food. It's out of fuel. It can't, it can't run anymore. So that's where the problem lies. And the anti-run-on valve is that, that big around and that tall. It's got a silver top and a black bottom. And uh, if you contact me and take some pictures from underneath your bonnet. Also, I, let me just let everybody know, too, that I'm, I'm available uh, if you want to FaceTime, um, not privately, but I mean your car. Um, and, and uh, you know, sometimes that, that's real handy. We can get down there and take a look and, and we can point at things. Or you can send me pictures and then we can look at the pictures together. Sometimes that's just as helpful. Um, I've got a, I've been corresponding pretty heavily with a guy in, in um, Norway who's got a TR6. I, I, I can speak, I can speak Triumph and I speak a little bit of Healy too, but um, anyway, this guy's just been having a horrible time trying to get SUs on his, on his TR6 to run right. And I'm looking at the picture today and all of a sudden I, I realized that he hasn't got his, his positive crankcase ventilation system hooked up correctly. So that's, that's the next step that he's doing. But anyway, it has to do with your PCB system and the anti-run-on valve. There's wiring, there's hoses, there's all kinds of stuff. But that's, that's where it is. So, okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Larry Maselli, again. My 55 TF project has a stripped spark plug thread. Is there any way to fix it without pulling the head? Oh my gosh! I already know the answer, John. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, those T-type heads come off pr pretty easily. That's pretty bizarre. That's uh, that's pretty unusual to have a stripped, stripped spark plug hole in a, in a. I mean, an aluminum head. That's one thing, but um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. But well, you know the answer. I mean, you could do it in place <laughs> and you get all the, you got to drill it and how you're going to drill it and get a, oh my gosh. So yeah, yeah, better to take it to somebody and spend a couple of hundred bucks and have, have it done, done right. And then you can get the hardened seats in your head if you don't have them in already. And then if that's not enough, if you haven't spent quite enough, um, then you can get the head ported and polished too, you know, so. Yeah, it's, it's a low, low mile, original owner car that we bought out of Michigan and it hasn't run in years and years and years. And this is obviously why. So I'll pull the head and see what else I have to deal with. All right. Okay. All right. Good luck. Thanks. All right. Uh, let's see. This is the MG car club of, uh, make sure to tell everyone the website is university motors limited.com. Otherwise they'll get a Honda dealer. That is absolutely true. There's a bunch of University Motors around the United States. I am uh, I'm University Motors LTD. That is right. Thank you very, very much. Um, Tom Starkweather has put a note in here that said that he, uh, he spent a day and didn't finish that complete lube list, and that, that's how, how extensive it, it is. So... I think I've gone through all the stuff that's on here, but if someone wants to uh, uh, open up and, and uh, let, let me know who they are, I'm happy to answer any questions so that, that you might have. We are recording this too. Um, so I, don't know, I don't know what happens after I, I record it. I know it's on my computer, but I don't know how I get it to you. Do I put it on YouTube or I, do I put it on a flash drive and send it to you? It doesn't seem quite right, but um, anyway, I, I am recording it, so I, I don't know how we're going to get it up, but as soon as my daughter tells me how we're going to, then I'll let everybody else know. Hi, John. Hi, John. Okay. All right. I had a, this is Eric. Sure. 
Yep, I'm, I'm here. Had a quick question on TDs and oil pressure gauge. Sure. Um, mine was, was uh, the oil pressure gauge was hooked to the, the top end of the external pipe on the head, and I've just recently moved it down to the bottom. Um, I've seen most of them I see look like they're on the bottom. Occasionally I see pictures of them that are on the head like mine was. It's an early TV. It's the 51, early 51. Yeah. And, um, is it supposed, are they all supposed to be on the bottom? No, they originally, it depends. It depends if you're playing the, the originality game or the functionality game. So um, if you want it, if you want to be Mr. Original, it's got to come off the top of the head where you get a solid 20 pound pressure loss. Um, almost always when you hook it down to, to the bottom, you're getting close, you're getting very, very close to what the real oil pressure is in, in the main gallery. So almost everybody moves it down there because getting an accurate reading is more helpful. Um, I mean, the, the, the TDs ha had, a, had a thermostat in, in the radiator, and it's like, okay, all right, that's helpful. But by the TF, they, they said, you know, it probably works better if we put it in the engine, you know, rather than in the radiator. And you get a more accurate reading of what's going on. So that yeah. putting an oil hose to the bottom there, even though you've got to extend the the, that copper line and some stuff like that, a little bit of hocus pocus. Um, it, it gives you a lot better, a lot more accurate reading. I always, whenever we did a car, we always, always hooked it up to the bottom, always. Yeah, it, 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 it about 40 pounds cold to about 80 pounds cold. So, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's a huge difference. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any downside to that. Nope, nope, you're getting an accurate reading now. So, okay, good. Thank you. Okay, all right. So, anyone else can uh, unmute themselves and come in. Uh, I don't see it. I don't think I've got any more questions here on my. Uh, I have a question. I, yeah, yeah. Oh. Appreciated your earlier remarks. Um, I, I have this car that's coming out of uh, hibernation about 18 years. Are, and are, are, are you like driving or what? No, no, no. I'm doing my essential shopping and I'm sitting in a, in a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Just a joke. Sorry. No. Okay. Yeah, a good joke. A good... So yeah. the MG is a 67 um, uh, GT and we've had it running. This was back in December. Mechanic was surprised that it started on the second turn of the key. Uh, he did the jerry can trick, you know, he didn't want to suck in the old uh, fuel. We haven't, but it is drinking fuel. Like he said, watch that liter of fuel go down when I run this car. And it literally went like that. So I, I'm pretty sure I need to take these carbs off and have them completely redone. That would that would make sense. That would that would make sense. I mean, it, it might. Yeah, absolutely. It can't. Yeah, no no engine drinks fuel that that quickly. Yeah. Can't. Um, so yeah, you you can get those re redone and and get new um, new shafts. Um, get the bodies re rebushed. There's right. People around that do. When when I was running the shop and. And um, we did carburetors. You, you, you send them back to you, they look like they were brand new. They're beautiful. They don't have to look beautiful to work. The, the bottom line is they have to work. Every now and then, somebody doesn't care if they work quite so much, they want them to look like jewelry. Um, but almost always people want them to work. And almost every, I, you know, the people around who, who, who do, this, do this work, uh, you can, you can uh, look up carburetor repair. Joe Curto is great. And yeah. We'll okay. Go through it and take take care of it. So, I appreciate that. I have had that recommendation earlier, and uh, yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. John, have you got time for one more? Absolutely. Um, just a question on my tack. It likes. It, oh, tell me the year and model again. Uh, it's a seventy-three B. Okay. So, if it sets like it was kind of dormant this winter. Um, I got the car last October, drove it home. Things seemed to work, but on the five-hour trip back from Ohio, 
that I'm thinking, man, I'm cruising along pretty good watching the tack. I take my foot off the gas, the tack didn't move. So I thought, all right. <laughs> so I started up during the winter and I thought, ah, my tack's working. So it seems like when it rests for a while, you know, maybe it just gets tired. It'll back drop back down to zero. Right now it's stuck like at three grand. So I've got another tack. And I thought, well, I think I'll just, you know, I'll try it. But I don't know how people stick their hand up in there. So is it, should I lower the steering column to try to get at that thing? Or? No, you don't have to do that, but you do have to take the heater control out. So you got the heater control knob. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, you got the heater control knob, so you turn it until you see the hole down, down um, against the center shaft. And into that, you insert a scribe or a, 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 a layout scribe or a, a little nail you're holding with a pair of vice grips. It pushes a pin out of the way, the knob comes off. Yeah. Now you can look in, into the hole there in the dash, and there's a 5 8 nut. So you need a deep 5 8 socket. Put that on, spin the nut off. There's a lock washer and a flat washer. Now the, now the, the uh, dial or the, the control is loose. And you can reach up behind there and, and yank it and move it and, and it drops out. And it drops down, it'll hang down by the throttle. And then you got all the room in the world to get up, up in there and change it. I'll try that. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, if, you, if you send, well, if you've got an, another tag and it's working okay, that's fine. The people on the, on the East Coast that do the car, or that do the, uh, Instrument repairs Nisinger Instruments in Mamaroneck, New York. And the people on the West Coast that do the repair uh, is uh, West Valley Instruments. And I don't know who does it in Toronto. There was a guy. Who did I talk to up there? And the, but they, some, some guy was older and he'd sold out all his stuff. I don't know who's doing it up in Toronto, but maybe with, with once they or open the border that uh, the Canadians and the Americans can get back t together again like like we should be able to. What was uh, the one on the East Coast? Uh, East Coast is Nisinger, N-I-S-O-N-G-E-R. Okay. Some people mispronounce it and call it Nisonger, but mm -hmm. I've always called it Nisinger. And when okay. Peter, Peter answers the phone, he'll call it Nisinger too. So, so it's worth... I, I, probably worth getting getting repaired i just figured oh, yeah, you, you want to if if you wait if you wait you know one thing breaks another thing breaks and then pretty soon you got 30 things that don't work and it's like it's no fun anymore you know so no, I, you, you fix it yourself I it more i figured it was more a problem with attack than saying yes. need coming to it because it sticks <laughs> you can take that tack out you can t there's two screws on the back the yep. cover comes off there used to be some uh, used to be an, uh, some O rings in there, and they've completely failed, completely failed. But you can take take the uh, uh, the ring off. You can take uh, lift the the glass out, clean that. Take the anti dazzle ring out, put some flat paint back on that, and then take the unit out. The, there's two screws in the back, and it just drops out in your hand. You don't want to get your finger on the face. Right. You'll, not, you'll never get that off and and you can look in there and you can see it. it's all electronic um, but the the needles on an axle and and uh, it's just stuck it just needs to be cleaned or oiled so if you get a little tiny tiny needle a little piece of wire put some real fine oil on it and go up and dot it on there um, then and then I'm not sure I'd spin the needle by hand you may, but be really cautious. You can blow on it, get get it to move. You know, maybe you can get it to free up, put put it back in. Nice, nice project. We're we're not out of the woods here for another uh, two weeks at least in Michigan. Yeah. So you got to find stuff to do. You know. Appreciate it. Okay. Hi, John. It's Neil Bryden speaking from the MG Car Club in Toronto. Yes, sir. How you doing? Great. Good. A uh, couple of quick questions. Uh, first of all, you were speaking earlier about uh, there's no lead in our gas. And I was wondering what your thoughts were about uh, the equivalent to putting a little bit of oil in the gas 
like we do in some outboard motors on our boats? I don't know. I, I've heard of that. Uh, I've heard of that, but you know, bottom line is that most of the gasoline you buy at the pump work, seems to work just fine. Just get get your car tuned so it's it's accepting it. What what year do you what year model do you own? Do you I got a I, I got a sixty four B. Okay, all right. No, there's not much in there that that's going to get ruined from the from the alcohol, and. Um, you guys might be ahead of us. How, how close are you guys to getting to getting the E85 stuff? Well, I can get 94 octane. Oh my gosh! Okay. But okay. it's still but it's still lead free. Oh yeah, it is. I mean, everything's lead free. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I I just I get whatever kind of gas that you're going to run, and uh, just tune your cars. You know, tune the carburetors, the everything else, the timing and the valve lash and those kinds of things. All all. Uh, are independent of the octane and um, uh, just tune it so it runs best on, on the whatever gas it's convenient for you to purchase. If you can always purchase that that good stuff, go for it. Um, but if, if you drive, you know, 300 miles away and there isn't a station that's got that kind of gas, it obviously, obviously isn't going to run the same with yeah. some other gasoline in it. Okay. Uh, quick second question. Yeah. So I got a Speedo that needs to be rebuilt, so I'm going to send it down to Nossinger. Um, but I'm also told that I need some part that comes out of the tranny. And whenever I try to get it, nobody wants to give me that because they said that once they sell me that part, the tranny that they get it out of is no good. So I'm just wondering, what have you got any suggestions? I don't think Nossinger is going to need the gear from your gearbox. Okay. I just, uh, that doesn't make sense. So um, originally there's a 90 degree drive on the side of the gearbox. And then, and then the, uh, the, the cable runs from there all the way up and in, into the front. We always got rid of those 90 degree drive units because they're nothing but trouble and bought like a 1974 MGB overdrive cable, which is six feet long. Uh, 2738, 1830s, 1 1.830 meters, and it's about six feet long. And you could you could give it a real nice radius underneath the car, tie it up with some zip ties underneath the car, and um, and bring it straight in behind the the speedo, and you know it it works great. Um, the problem with your speedo is that the is it speedo doesn't work, the odo doesn't work, both. Well, um, yeah. It, yeah, so speedo doesn't work. It's all messed up. So okay, but does does your is the odometer correct? Uh, no, it quit working as well. Okay, all right. Um, but they but you've had the cable in your hands, and, and you know that the cable still turns. Uh, I think the cable. I, I think I'd replace the cable to just for okay. insurance. Just some, for insurance. Sometimes what happens is the speedo the speedo freezes that in turn either snaps the cable or worse, ruins the driven gear in the gearbox. And just for anyone who's looking for used parts, um, there's a guy in Arvada, Colorado, which is Denver. His name is Paul Deershaw, and he runs a, a firm called Sports Car Craftsman. Paul Deershaw, Sports Car Craftsman in Denver. And he has a braking yard. He's got hundreds of MGs. And if he has the part, he will send it to you tomorrow that fast. You don't have to call him three weeks later and find out that he couldn't find a box big enough or his dog got sick or something. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a real place. And um, um, I don't know how, you know, I can't speak for him what he charged you or how difficult <laughs> it is right now get, getting it across the board or anything. But but if you did need something like that, Paul, Paul would would have would have that. So. Okay. Well, thanks very much, John. Appreciate hey, hey, all you're doing for us. Hey, and uh, Peter's got something s set up with the club for a, a private session coming up uh, later. So. Yep. Looking forward to it. Great. Great. Take care. St stay Thank safe. You. Okay. So we're at eight fifteen, um, and uh, I've got no more me messages here on my on my. Uh, Note. Hey, John, I just bounced in. It's Russ Lefevre from Detroit, Windsor. Yeah. I'm trying to 
well, I've, I've rebuilt my a couple of carburetors, a couple of Zenith Strombergs, yeah. and the kits don't seem to include the the O rings for the uh, choke metering valve, and then the you know that brass piece that fits into the into the the choke housing, and then the the, the and then they don't they don't have the needle the O ring for the for the little for the needle yeah. That thing's, that thing's about as big as a pencil dot on a piece of paper. It's a tiny, so a guy gave me a part number for those. Um, uh, talk to talk to Kurto. He's got, certainly got the, the O-rings for the needles. Yeah, that's what I was going to call. I meant to call him today, and I and I just got away from me. I didn't even go out in the garage today. But they, none of the kits seem like they have that anymore. I've, you know, I've done five yeah. or six different Strombergs. Well, we, and we never, we never found that the, uh, that brass barrel that fits up inside that aluminum housing that receives the, the, the choke needle. Um, no, there, there was never an O-ring for that. I've got, I made up a bunch of little tools so you could drive that out and drive it back in without damaging it. Yeah, I've got, I've got, I made my own tools for that as well. And, cool. and the, the, the OD rings are just, you know, a half inch, half inch 16 and a 3 8 16. But the little dinky little O-ring, and it really ticked me off as I, I re rebuilt one this last weekend, and it happened to be mine, and it had a Viton had a Viton uh, O-ring on it, and I popped that Viton O-ring off, looking went looking for my new O-ring, and there's not in the kit. So I went back to an old. So I went to somebody else's kit that I had sitting on the shelf, and it's not in there either. Right. Uh, Zakoff, Z A. Yeah, I know they're they're down they're they're right down the street from me. Yeah, you, you got to you got to buy twenty five bucks worth of O rings, but you know it's when you run into a snag like this, twenty five bucks it isn't much. So you, they they've got a the, a whole supply there. I I get my Viton rings from them. They've got an outlet here in Grand Rapids. So yeah. All right. Well, I was there. hoping. I was hoping you see you, you knew somebody with a kid other than Joe that I could. I, mm -hmm. I think I'm just going to call him up and get 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 what I need. Yep. Yep. Well, gentlemen, ladies, Madame and Monsieur, thank you very very kindly for uh, um, listening to me prattle on here for an hour and twenty minutes tonight, and and uh, we'll look forward to doing this again. I think I said uh, May fifth, uh, two weeks from tonight. And if you've got questions in the meantime, you can always call me. My phone number's on the website, and I'm, I'm happy to, to answer your questions. I'll make another unabashed pitch to go to my PayPal, you know, and, and uh, uh, make, make me happy. Thank you. And um, John? Yes? Excuse me for interrupting. Could you, could you spell, please, uh, Deershaw's name, the fellow in Denver? Yeah. Um, Paul, that's easy. And his yep. last name, it's a mouthful. It's a D I E R. Yeah. S C H O W. And it's Sports Car Craftsman. Actually, I think I may have, if you go to my website. Okay. Um, I, I've got a page up there of uh, like recommended suppliers. And I think his phone number's on there. All right, great. So he's, he's just great. I mean, he's just, he's got a real nice shop. There's, there's three or four really, really nice shops around the country. I mean, big yeah. shops that lots of people practice on their own, but um, I was one of them in, in uh, Glenn Lenhard in, in Tampa, uh, he, you know, just doing it all day. And, and uh, Paul does a real nice job. And then in Stockton, California, you got uh, British Car Specialists. So yeah. those, are, those are some real good sized shops, that, you know, that employ, Five, ten people, you know, so. I'm also looking for a Wabasto sunroof. That's why I needed the spelling. That's terrific. Okay. All right. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very kindly. I'm going to say good night and uh, happy octagonal dreams to everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Thanks, John. See you John. next time. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John.